Greetings. Welcome back to another Truth Factor discussion. We'd like to thank you for joining us today as we factor the truth of God's Word into your life and our life, or I should say into our lives, and hopefully into your life as well. We have been uh, gone for two weeks. I was on vacation last week, and so we're jumping back into our study. If you are joining us for the first time and you're a little bit unfamiliar with how to participate, let me kind of share with you how you can participate in our study today. If you're viewing this on our Facebook page, then just use the comment section connected with this video. Let us know what you have to think. If you're viewing this on our YouTube channel, then you can use the chat area there. Um, you can also send us email if you would like. You can send it to questions at truthfactorlive.com or email us individually, as you see on the screen there beside you, john at truthfactor.com, paul at tom at etc. Write to us if you'd like to. Let us know what you have to think. We'd love to hear from you. All right, let's go ahead and bring everyone in. We are lacking two today, so we'll just have to suffer with the four of us. How's everyone doing this morning? I'm doing fine. Doing fine. Let's see. So now we have Tom, not Tom, sorry. Yeah. Uh, Bob, that's it. <laughs> Bob. Bob is on the East Coast in Georgia. Is that right, Bob? Yes. Okay. And then Tom is on the West Coast in California. And Brian is out there in the Northwest Territory of the West Coast as well. And our, I'm right our program is coast to coast. Yeah, we are coast to coast. That's right. And we're if you want to. That's right. <laughs> the hub. You, John, you are neither oh. right nor left. We are, I'm in Oklahoma right City, in Oklahoma. Yep. Technically, Edmond, if, Oklahoma is where I live. So. If Paul and Brendan were here, we'd have every time zone, wouldn't we? We yeah. would. We would. Yeah. Brendan is in Mountain, right? <laughs> yeah. And Paul's in, um, yeah. That's All right, let's see. Point. We have we have several joined us today. We have Chris Kramer from Truth and Reason. Uh, Jerry Wilcox is with us. We have Vadar Vadyar, pardon me on the name pronunciation. Vadyar that would Cigar. Be VJ. That would be VJ is his name. If you say so. Uh, it is. <laughs> He's from the <laughs> Philippines. He's on the oh, Tuesday. okay. Yeah. VJ. Okay. All right. Sorry about that. I was way off base on that one. We have Easy. Gregor with us as well. David, good to have you with us here also. And if you have not, if you haven't, if you're here and you've not made a comment, just drop a note into the comment area, the chat area and say, Hey, I'm Bob from Minnesota or wherever you're from. Just tell us hi. And, and we'll say hi back to you. Thank you so much for joining us for our study. Okay. We are continuing in our study through, um, the Gospel of John, and we have finished upwards through chapter three, and we're going to be starting in John yeah. chapter four this morning. John chapter four. All right, let's see. Any thoughts? Is there anything in particular we want to say about the general about John chapter four before we get into the study of it? Any thoughts on it? This is really one of the first instances, isn't, isn't it? Aside from prophecies, of course, in John's record, at least, where we see a solid reference to Gentiles being, well, really, okay, let's, let's do a little background case in point. Um, the Samaritan woman was not a Gentile by the way that we would think of Gentiles, right? Because she, she was, was from, what's that? She was not a Jew. Samaritans she, were a breed of their own. But they where were, did they come from? They so, came from so back in, yeah, Second Kings 17, we read about them. Yeah, a mixture of the uh, remnants of the priesthood in the northern kingdom after it was destroyed uh, as they intermarried with the people that came from all over the Assyrian Empire. Now, yeah. now, what's kind of neat about their story is that, by the way, there are still Samaritans today. There's still a large group of people that uh, observe Samaritan laws. And as Bob said, they're the people that were brought in by the Assyrians, 
from uh, all over the world and settled in there. And then they were given Israelite priests uh, in order to learn how to worship. Um, in the time of Nehemiah, about 200 years later, they tried to participate in the building of the temple and rebuilding of Jerusalem, and they were denied that. So after that, we see that they established their own place of worship at Mount Gerizim. And uh, that's where this story in John chapter 4 is taking place, in fact. Now, but 100 years before Jesus, uh, during the time that the Maccabees were uh, uh, kind of running Israel, Jews uh, gathered together and destroyed that temple. So you can get the sense that this is a very bitter and contentious relationship that they have, um, that there's they're, they're two ideas. And, and by the time of Jesus... The Samaritans had ceased to say they were fellow worshipers of God. They had begun to say they were the true worshipers of God. They had kind of, to the exclusion of the Israelites, they had uh, begun to see themselves as the heirs. And you see that in the woman's words when she talks about our father Jacob. Um, that would be a very okay. contentious statement that she's saying there. All right. That's a good point. Um, yeah, you, you know... You know, I I sometimes in describing the Samaritans, uh, we're, we're we're studying through the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. You know, from a historical standpoint, and we've talked about Assyria. I I actually consider the captives who were displaced to the Samaritan region, or the Samaria region, uh, as a result of Assyria. I I actually describe them as the forerunners to the Samaritans, and 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 I see the idea of the Samaritans. What Brian was talking about during what we would call the, the 400 years of silence. You know, uh, mm -hmm. the, the Samaritans we read about in the New Testament, where they are at developed during that period between the end of the Old Testament of Malachi and uh, the Gospels. And, and uh, you know, like Brian brought that out about 100, 150 BC. Yeah. And, the, and they are, oh, go ahead, Bob. Mm -hmm. When the Assyrian people were brought in, uh, basically because there were no people in the northern kingdom, that area, to worship God. And the Assyrians were afraid of angering the God of that region uh, because they had robbed him of his worshipers. So they sent their people in there to worship that God, but then they, got to, they don't know how to worship this God. So they sent the priests back, but these priests were appointed by uh, Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, they weren't teaching the, the true worship of God. They were worshiping other gods in addition to the one true and living God. Yeah. And so these people, at least the original people who came over and eventually, I imagine, intermarried with the priesthood, uh, were, were, were practicing a perverted worship. Now, I don't know how much that had changed. Maybe Tom does know how much that had changed. Had they stopped worshiping these other gods by the time of the New Testament? Yeah, you know, and and again, I wouldn't know everything about that, but but I get the impression, I get the impression that when Jesus is visiting the Samaritan woman, getting to our text, that they are a they are a one God, they are a one God people. You know, that it it, it seems to me that they're mon monotheistic, and uh, so. There and I would even say they're worshiping Yahweh, but they're worshiping Him yeah. differently than the way that the Jews were. Well, okay, so let's let's back up. I'm well, not back up. Two two questions, and we'll get into the text there. And I think just relevant for 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 people at home as well. What is the significance about the city of Samaria? That was the capital of yes. the northern nation. Not not initially, um, but which king made Samaria the um, the capital? Who was it? Was it Ahab? I think it was before Ahab, but I don't remember. Um, I don't remember now. I have to look it up. So Jeroboam moved worship north, and he set yep. up worship in the city. But I, I'm trying to remember who made the capital. Um, well, he set up the high places, and yeah. and and um, Dan and um, Bethel. Or Bethel and Ai. Anyway, yeah, that was Jer remember. Jeroboam's okay. the one that did that. Uh, yeah, it says but, Omri, Omri. Omri is the king that did it. He bought the hill he the son of from Shemnar. He was the father of Ahab. Father of Okay. That made, okay. So yeah. 
That, that's why I said why they call it why Samaria so important because this they were the capital when the city fell, you know when the whole the northern nation fell. Um, the other thing is let's real quick talk about this. She said that you worship in Jerusalem, we worship on Mount Grism. Quick history lesson on Grism and Mount Ebal. Anyone? That's right. That's right. Yeah, that's right. The two mountains, the blessing and the curse. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Um, in the Mosaic Law, one of them, he set up two mountains, one for, as you said, blessing, one mount of blessing, one mount of cursing. So the idea would be when a blessing was to be issued or bestowed, they would go up to that mountain and pronounce, you know, if you serve the Lord uh, always, then this will be done for you. But if it was a cursing, they would go up to the other mountain. What, which one was which? Who remembers? I didn't look this up ahead of time. And I always Is get all the curse. Yeah, Gerizim, oh, Bobby, begins with a, Gerizim begins with a G. Good. G stands for good. Okay. Ebal starts with evil. a G. I will never right, forget Bob? now, Tom. That's good excellent. versus evil. <laughs> yeah, very good, Tom. I won't forget In that. the English language, at least. Um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's our mnemonic. Our mnemonic, that's right. And there is an account in the Judges... And I shouldn't bring this up because I'm not remembering it, where there was a cursing pronounced from the Mount of Blessing, if I remember correctly, because what would end up happening is it was going to be, the, the end result was going to be good. Um, but anyway, so so what, what you're talking about, Brian, earlier, they had, the people had erected an altar, a place of worship on Mount Chorism. Is this the altar of Joseph? No. Joshua? Uh, it's the Jacob's well. Jacob's well. There was another uh, one, though. The altar that. on Mount uh, Gerizim. See, I thought there was a mount, an altar on Mount Ebal. And Mount Ebal. it ended up being Gerizim, though, where they would end up worshiping. Um, sorry, I'm just um, not recalling specifically. thought I should have had it all figured out. But anyway, so we're going get, to get, get into the reading here. So the, the reason I brought that up is the significance of why Samaria, okay, we've already talked about that, and why she references they worship on Mount Grism. That's a great question. You know, why would they be worshiping on Mount Grism? And the other thing is, um, if you stop and think about, and I think y'all already touched on this, the, 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 the priests that Jeroboam would have put in place would not have been the Israelite priests or the Le Levitical priesthood. But yet they probably would have tried to mimic it in some form or fashion because he wanted to keep the people from going back to Jerusalem to worship the Lord. That was the reason why Jeroboam did that. But through the course of time, they did incorporate the worship of false gods. So when we get to this stage at this point, there's still a profession of worshiping God. And I believe it, like Tom said a while ago, I think it is uh, Yahweh. Um, and so let's get into that for a minute, because I think that's really not the main point that is going to be made here. He doesn't <laughs> criticize them for how they worship, okay? Um, other than one, maybe one significant point there. Okay, Brian shared a couple of verses with us. Um, so it was Joshua built an altar to the Lord on Mount Ebal, and um, Mount Gerizim was for blessings, and Mount Ebal was for cursing. Deuteronomy eleven twenty nine and then Joshua eight thirty, okay, and then uh, Chris jumps in as well. Deuteronomy twenty seven four is where Joshua built an altar. Okay, well let's go ahead and start our reading here. And Brian, if you would, let's start in verse number one, and let's go ahead and get into the context a little bit here. Let's come down to verse number eight. I think will be a decent right. stopping point there. Reading in John chapter 4, verses 1 through 8, reading out of the New King James Version. Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself did not baptize but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again to Galilee. But he needed to go through Samaria, so he came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, thus uh, sat thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. Or his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Okay. All right. 
So just a couple things by way of introduction. We've already talked about some of it, I think, is significant as we get through here. Um, what had the Pharisees heard, though, Brian? Uh, that Jesus was now baptizing more people than John had baptized. And, of course, the distinction is made here. It's not Jesus himself baptizing people, um, yeah. which kind of makes sense. You know, um, you know, if, if Jesus baptized somebody, you would think, well, that baptism really... Uh, you know, is really special. And so it's, uh, it makes sense that Jesus himself is doing the baptizing. Well, well and we I also have to room. Oh, go ahead, Bob. Mm -hmm. I was going to say it's the same thing with reverence to Paul and Corinth. Who baptizes you? It doesn't matter. Why you're being baptized is what matters. And so Jesus could continue preaching while his disciples were baptizing. And so uh, he, he farms that out, so to speak. He gives his disciples that responsibility to baptize people while he continues to preach the coming of the kingdom. Okay. Well, that's a good point. Somebody did. Mm -hmm. Somebody told me a story once that in certain countries, uh, brethren, it, it is a big deal who baptized you, that there is kind of a problem with that struggle, that if you were baptized by a well-known preacher or somebody of some uh, esteem, that there's, there is a significance there. And, and while, Maybe that's not quite the same. Uh, you know, I don't hear uh, us talking about that like that in America. There may be other countries where who baptized you is a big deal. And I think that that's what is being avoided here in verse two. Yeah, I made to think of C.R. Nickel, uh, who reportedly baptized thousands of people. An interesting story about him. I know it's not on the Gospel of John, but he, he was the only convert in a tent meeting when he was a, a child. And yet, because he went and heard the gospel and was converted, thousands of other people were baptized as a result of his preaching. And uh, so what, it doesn't matter really that he baptized them. Uh, he was responsible for their being baptized, even if he did not baptize them personally. That's a good point. We got a really good question in the chat. Um, yeah, let me let, so let's go ahead bring that. Yeah. Let's go ahead and bring that in because um, I was getting ready to touch on that, not this that specific statement, but the purpose of the baptisms. So, um, Chris, truth and reason. Chris says, was Jesus' baptism different than John's at that time? It's a good question. You know, I would my gut instinct, which is not always a good thing, is that they were the same. Yeah, um, because at this point, and this is why they were baptizing, the, it, it was con directly connected with the message, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And so that was the message that John was preaching. And we also know that that was the same message that Jesus and his disciples were teaching, preaching as well. It's just interesting that in their baptism unto repentance, remission of sins, that Jesus himself was not baptizing anyone. Um, any thoughts about that? Yeah, at this and, point, um, oh, go ahead, Bob. No, you go ahead, Brian. Uh, I was going to say, at this point, uh, no one could be baptized into Jesus's death, burial, and resurrection. So until yeah. Jesus dies, that baptism doesn't exist. And exactly. also, both baptisms, <laughs> and there I go speaking as if they were different. Uh, John and Jesus both baptized only Jews. And okay. because they were the ones who were being prepared for the coming kingdom. The time would come when Gentiles would be gathered in or folded in or whatever. As John, uh, as Jesus himself says in John chapter 10. Uh, and, uh, and that happens, of course, as reported by Luke in Acts chapter 10. But uh, yeah, it was, a, it was a specific baptism for a specific group of people did not put them into the kingdom because the kingdom did not exist. It was not in Jesus' name because he was he had not yet been given all authority, nor was it a baptism into his death because he had not died. And so uh, many differences between the baptizing, uh, the baptism of John and Jesus and the baptism of the Great Commission that the apostles performed uh, in the book of Acts. You know, that's... And that we perform today. 
yeah, I think that's a good explanation of it. I hadn't really made a connection, but you think about the amount when the apostles, when the, they were sent out on the limited commission, and they talk about how they go to the various cities and how even the, the demons were subject unto them. I think would think it's a safe bet, not safe bet, that's sorry. It would be safe to say that they were this, they were baptizing and you know, when they went out preaching the kingdom is coming, that this just, just wasn't one instance of where they would baptize people, but that was part of the message that was being preached in preparing them for the coming of the kingdom. Um, in, in other words, they did it frequently is what, guess what I'm saying. Um, but we have another comment. So this is really good. And this is one that I will say also one more time that I thought about and I thought, no, I'm not going to bring it up because we're not going to start that type of discussion. But here comes Gregor's comment. Gregor says, would that mean all these people, including the apostles needed to be rebaptized on or after Pentecost? Well, I, I think that's exactly what it means. Um, I, do too. I, I think that if yeah. uh, if we cannot say they could have been baptized into Jesus's death, burial, and resurrection until his death, burial, and resurrection, uh, they were not baptized into that until afterwards. And since the first time after Jesus dies, we see baptism in Act Two, I think mm -hmm. I think the conclusion we necessarily uh, uh, it's a necessary inference is that they were baptized. Yeah, the Bible doesn't and have Gregor to himself tell us. Points that out. Yes. Okay, yeah. The Bible doesn't have to specifically say, and the apostles were also baptized on that day. It doesn't have to say that. I think, and you use the term, and you've already said the necessary inference. I think that's a good point there. All right, let's see. Yeah, yeah that is Go a ahead. good point. Mm -hmm. I, I've often made the point, and, and I guess, uh, and I guess based on what Brian just said, I might rethink this, <laughs> but I, I've often made the point that if they were baptized prior to the death, burial, and resurrection. I mean, the thing is, is what John was preaching. And, it, it, and in Luke 3, it's very, very clear that what he was preaching was a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. It was right. a baptism yeah. that washed their sins away. The same statement. Um, I, I've, I've, held to, uh, I, I've, I've held the position that if they were properly baptized prior, then maybe they did not have to be baptized again because of the understanding of what was there. But but Brian makes a good point. And of course, the other observation to make in that is where we are concerned, it is a moot point. Yeah. You know, yeah. because because uh, we're 2,000 years to the side, and I don't know anybody that was there. Uh, but I, I mean, it, it, I don't know if you want to call it a matter of trivia you know, a, a trip, uh, a discussion from that standpoint, but, uh, uh, it, it, it's good to know from that standpoint, but, but I like the point that Brian was making about death, burial, resurrection, which we understand very much. You cannot separate baptism from that where we are concerned. And it hadn't happened yet when John and Jesus and his disciples were baptizing, whether God accepted them or not, uh, you know, you know, that's between God and them. <laughs> Well, you know, as far as I that agree. goes. Yeah. But but think about this as well. Jump forward just a handful of years to when uh, with the case in point of um, Apollos. Yeah. Acts okay? 18, 19. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then the, yeah, exactly. And especially when you look at Acts chapter 19, they only knew of the baptism of John. Right. And yeah. so he went and then baptized them in the baptism of Jesus Christ. And so. Whether that was on the day of Pentecost or five years after Pentecost or 10 years after Pentecost, I think it would still be in the same situation. Yeah. And, and, and again, that's my point. When, when I look at when I look at the Acts 18, 19, I believe that those were individuals that were being baptized after Jesus arose from the dead and they were baptized in the name of John which would have not been valid after Jesus arose from the dead. That, that's, that's a good that, that's, yeah, that's the approach that I take, you know, as yeah. to an answer that that's what I that's what I believe as that or and and like I said, but but anyways, that may it, be it's a, worth bringing up because that it, may be it, a fair a discussion. Inference. I would say that's a fair inference, but I wouldn't say it's a necessary one. Another distinction I see in the in the baptism of John and Jesus before the cross, 
and the baptism of the Great Commission is that under John and Jesus, people were baptized for the remission of covenant sins. It was not for the remission of alien sins. And so it did not bring them into a covenant because they had been born into that covenant. But after Pentecost, there is a new covenant and you had to be baptized under it. And so to me, it doesn't matter when these 12 disciples or Apollos for that matter uh, were baptized. Mm -hmm. They had not been baptized under the new covenant. And that's what they needed. Uh, to yeah. be to, to to receive remission for alien sins, so they could become citizens in the kingdom, as opposed to aliens. Yeah. Um, real quick, uh, true of uh, true. Chris also does share with us uh, the thought. We are not told in any Bible verse that they were baptized into John's baptism either. He's talking about the apostles, I believe which is an interesting side point there. We don't really, really see that. Um, but David Clark asks, and this looks like something we, that Brian has answered in the chat room. Uh, would it not be best to have a believer baptize you? And um, Brian, what did you say about that? Well, um, I, 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 he's not saying it, it was necessary. He just asked the question, would it be best? Yeah. I, I wouldn't disagree with that. But yep. uh, if if I were to change that and say, is it necessary? Well, at least one person on X, in, on the day of Pentecost, at least one person was baptized by somebody who hadn't been baptized. So, um, you know, it, we, we, we are forced to conclude that it's not completely necessary, but uh, I, I wouldn't argue that it's probably best, you know, that I would, that's my preference. Yeah. Right. And, and I would definitely say it's best because somebody that is a believer Obviously, they understand what's being done. But but if if I'm not mistaken, and again, I haven't read all the history. What didn't wasn't Alexander Campbell baptized by a Baptist preacher, and and uh, uh, the Baptist preacher did it out of respect, you know, for who Campbell yeah. was, even though uh, if, even though he didn't believe it himself, he baptized him for the reason that Campbell requested. Yeah, him and um, Thomas as well. Yeah. If I remember, that was, that was Matthias or Matthew Luce, L-U-C-E. Oh, okay. that was the preacher. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and again, he did, he didn't believe it, but out of respect, he did it. But they Campbell, they requested. But Campbell was immersed. He had never been immersed. Yeah. Uh, and so I'm not sure Campbell at that time connected water baptism with remission of sins. He just understood that it. It meant immerse, and it Instead did not sprinkled. include sprinkled or yeah. poured. Yeah. Because in sprinkling or pouring, the water receives the action. You sprinkle or pour the water. You don't sprinkle or pour the man. But yeah. you immerse the man. You immerse the woman. Um, real quick, um, my, my, um, the browser that I use to monitor the chats, has decided to update with the new format for whatever reason, I don't know. So it's taken me a little bit to process this a little bit better. I got to work on that. Chris says that I believe they were baptized and we'll, we'll move on here shortly. This is a little bit off topic, but I believe they were baptized because Peter said in Acts 11 that they had received the gift of tongues when we first believed, indicating they were baptized just as he commanded Cornelius, Cornelius to do so. So interesting point there. And um, Gregor, he says something that I, I don't know. This is highly controversial, but he says, Bob, you have a marvelous brain. And um, <laughs> Gregor <laughs> says that. And then uh, Lori Clark says, hi, the apostles were baptized before Christ died. So if he chose them, we were not told they were rebaptized. And, and you're right. We are talking about stuff that the Bible doesn't specifically state. We're trying to make and some inferences. And Gregor, the hundred dollars on his way to you via PayPal. <laughs> okay. All like right. I promise. Hey, don't listen. And you guys at home, don't expect to receive payment if you compliment us. Just Bob decided to be extra nice today. Yeah, All but right. you know what? Now Bob put it on record. He did. <laughs> he did. <laughs> All right. So let's let's move on here real quick. So we, we've already so we already talked about, and let me bring it back up so everyone can see. We already talked about city of Samaria 
and um, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. It goes back to why they were at the well there. And um, about the sixth hour, a woman of Samaria came to water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. Now, if you were the Samaritan woman, Tom, would you have been shocked by this interaction? Uh, for a number of reasons, you know, you know I, I mean, I mean, the fact that Jesus was willing to talk to her, there, there, there's, there's a lot of reasons why, you know, of course, we know her history, only because Jesus reveals that later on. But the fact that she was a Samaritan, that within itself, the, the Jews and the Samaritans hated each other. And, and um, as a whole, yeah, I mean, obviously, I think there was uh, there would obviously be distinctions, but but as a whole, they were at enmity with each other as, as people, and and don't think for a moment that it was one sided, you know, it was it was mutual, you know, between them. Secondarily, this is a woman, and and in that culture, men did not communicate with women and women in this kind of a circuit, as far as I understand, you know, uh, and, and so you had those two circumstances. And then obviously the fact that she's out there by herself is a pretty good indication that she had been shunned by many within that community, which is why she's there when she's there. And so you tie those three things together and yet Jesus takes the time to talk to her and uh, that leads to a conversation. That's a good point. Good point. Okay. Um, we're going to go in the next section. I do have one more thought. Okay. One more note about the Samaritans. The gospel was taken to the Samaritans second. Think about it. Preached on the day of Pentecost to the Jews. Taken to the Samaritan by Philip. And then we have the Gentiles with Cornelius. So just an interesting point there to kind of throw out there. Yeah. Right, and, so and Mr. John, you, you know, you also added that in Acts 8. You have the Samaritan, and you also have the Ethiopian eunuch. So you have, mm -hmm. you, you have a, for lack of a better term, a half Jew, you know. Yeah, uh, I, yeah. and, and I think that's what the Samaritans were, which is why they were despised so much. But then you have the eunuch, who very possibly could have been a Gentile who had converted to Judaism. Yeah. And therefore, uh, you know, uh, he's not full-blooded Jew, but yet he is Jewish. Yeah. And, and that's, what, that's what you get in Acts 8. And then the Acts 10 that's is the full Gentile. Cornelius. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, Cornelius. So I've often thought it interesting that he went to the Samaritans before, officially Samaritans, before going to the Gentiles, as far as the way it lays out there. So let's go and ahead that, and go ahead, Bob. That's in keeping mm -hmm. with the outline that, that Luke laid out. In Acts chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, uttermost parts of the earth. Good point. And uh, one other thing on that, uh, I had a minute ago, but uh, the train has left the station. So proceed. <laughs> that was the fastest thought Bob's ever made or comment. So... <laughs> All right, Bob, I'm going to have you to read. So maybe maybe stepping aside and reading something will, will jog what you were thinking about. Um, okay. Let's start in verse 9. And let's read down through. Well, it's more of a lengthier reading. Let's go ahead and plan to stop at um, verse 15. It's not the best of a stopping point, but let's read verses 9 through 15, if you would, right. please. And again, like uh, Brian, I'm reading from the New King James Version. Uh, hold on. I'm in chapter 1. Just a second. Let me get to where I need to be. I can't see my big screen with the uh, laptop in my way, so... Uh, Okay, verse 9 through 15. Then the yes, woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealing with Samaritans. 
Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as well as his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I may not thirst, nor come here to draw. All right. Thank you, Bob. So going back up here to verse number nine, we've already talked a little bit about her being surprised, shocked that Jesus would even be talking to her, much less asking her for a drink of water. And she kind of labels it very specifically for Jews have no dealings with Samaritans there. Um, now, but according Bob, to go ahead. New King James, the quotation marks end after woman, and that this may be a, a remark of John's. For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. In his narr in his narrative here, or narration. Okay, so Mark's not inspired, but that's just an observation I've made here. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. Um, be, but even if it's John's commentary on it, if if you would, he would Early have known before. firsthand. Yeah, yeah. That's right. Um, so in verse number ten, he says, you know, if, if you knew the gift of God and who it will, is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him for a drink and um any thoughts on this particular statement you know, of course she'll, she'll have no idea what he's what he's talking about but what do we know about this well now he doesn't say drink in reference to her he says you would have asked him and he would have given you living water if she knew who he was she would have asked him for living water she wouldn't have bothered asking him for a drink she would, have, she would have known and understood the living water that he could give her if she knew yeah. who he was, but he didn't. Yeah. And so uh, what he's basically communicating to her, there's something more important than this uh, literal water in this well. And you need it more than I need the water in the well. Yeah. And it tells us something else. We We finally found someone, if you would, who knows nothing about him. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Um, is it, you, you say VJ? Is that yeah, his VJ, name? VJ, yes. he, he says in the comments section over on Facebook side of the world, John 4, 7, Jews have no dealings with Samaritans, and kind of a cross-reference back to Ezra, chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. Yeah. And Caleb, I missed his just a moment ago. He says... Um, I don't think he's greeting Ethiopia. Hey, Ethiopia. <laughs> Ethiopia receives the gospel before Europe, an important role for the history of the gospel and the church. It's a good point. Good point. And then uh, we have a quick greeting. I missed the greeting earlier from Aileen. She greeted us, and she's here with us. But how do you pronounce the name? Jivan? Jivan? He says, greetings from the Church of Christ in Hyderabad. India. Okay. All right. So they're, they're in, so the idea of Jesus being living water, bread of life, this is all part of his teaching process anyway. And the more you study and the more she would learn about him, the more she would understand this statement there. But it did, it did perplex her because he has nothing to draw with and it's a deep well. So then her question is, where then do you get that living water? And she asked the question, are you greater than who? Jacob. Yeah. So well, she it's says, interesting. our father, Jacob. Um, yeah. yeah. And what's what's interesting is that's a provocative statement. Um, I, I don't think this is a nice exchange. Um, I think that okay. that's kind of a, um, that's kind of a, you know, who do you think you are? You know, um, you know, that it that it's meant to push at Jesus. It's meant to be kind of derogatory. Our father, Jacob, you know, not your father, Jacob, our father, Jacob. It's kind of like, 
you know, a, ca a Catholic and the Orthodox guy get together. We were the ones that started and you split off from us. You know, that's uh, her her statement. I don't think is meant to be merely a this. That's what are you going to do? I think it's meant to be kind of a provocative push at Jesus. And of course, you know, what Jesus is going to say is completely not the way she thought this conversation would go. I hadn't really caught that. That's a good, interesting point. Yeah, very good, very possible there. We um, don't call him brain for nothing. That's right. <laughs> but, we, but we don't call him brain either, so. <laughs> but, so, I do. so one other thought about this before we go on, you, you, you think about what they had to go back to. And what I mean go back to, I'm talking about the Samaritans, and we've already discussed kind of the course of, the, uh, of their development, especially in the 400-year 400 400-year period. They clearly rejected Jerusalem as being the place to worship. And we'll see that here in just a moment. But it looks like they only go back to the Pentateuch. In, in some ways, you know, the, the history in Genesis. And because the Pentateuch right. doesn't say where to worship him at. Yeah. But here's what's kind of neat about that. She says, we believe in the Messiah. Well, why do you believe in the Messiah? Well, probably the only promise you can draw out of the Pentateuch about the Messiah, there's some inferences there mm -hmm. that are pretty strong. But Moses says, there'll be a prophet like me one day, which which has a lot of weight in the book of John in particular. Early on, they say, are you the prophet? Um, but uh, it is interesting that uh, you're absolutely right that the Samaritans only believe in the first five books of the Old Testament. And so there's not a lot of language there that establishes some of the things that they then say, you know, we don't believe in. But the Messiah one, I think, is really interesting out of that. Yeah, very interesting. Yeah, because, again, we, we don't, you know, nowhere in the Pentateuch is Jerusalem identified as a place to worship. Hebron's not, you know. At the closest you would get is Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal. If you and think I think Gerizim. Uh, Gerizim, I, I've always said Gerizim, uh, but Brain might be right on that. Uh, that was the, the Mount of Blessing, yeah. as, as opposed to the Mount of Cursing. So I can understand that being eventually the place where they would settle their, uh, mm -hmm. their central uh, point of worship. Because, you know, all, although the Lord would later reject high places of worship, many of the places, including where the temple was built, was up on a mountain, effectively. And so it would make yeah. sense. Chrism, a mountain would be a place they would worship. Yeah, that's a good point, Bob. Good point. All right, let's see. A little bit more here in the text. So he makes a statement, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. Talking about the well water. Whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But here's kind of the key. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. Any thoughts or comments about the power behind this statement? My thought for a while has been that uh, by imbibing that water of life, uh, we cannot help but bubble over with that and share it with others. Okay. And, and, and to me, that is the fountain. Uh, that is the fa fountain of water that springs up from each one of us as we share the gospel with others because it means so much to us. So not only is the, 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 we will never thirst because of this water, not only will it always and forever keep us alive, if you would, but it becomes a source of life for others around us. Okay. That's a good way of looking at that. Yeah. Um, Jivan had asked a question, who were Samaritans and why were they mentioned under a third place in Acts, the first chapter? We kind of talked about that um, at the first part of our study. So if you have an opportunity, once once we're done with our study, to kind of go back and look at it when we at the from the beginning, we talk about the history of the Samaritans there, um, and we kind of did touch on their 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 spot in uh, Jews, Samaritans, and then the Gentiles a little bit earlier too. Um, but it's an interesting history there to who who they were and where they came from, and. Um, they were in closer proximity to, to Jerusalem and Judea. 
I mean, they're, they're nearest, nor- nearest neighbors. Yeah. So and you have to travel sense. through it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, not sure what... Is David talking about the, the oh, Pentateuch? Okay, that's what he's talking about there. Um, yeah, first five books of the Old Testament. Brian answers that one there. Yeah, first five books of the Old Testament. Um, is that because Penta means five? I think so. Okay. Also yeah. called okay. the Torah, I think, by the, uh, Torah. By the Jews. Yeah, that's right. Um, okay. But and that means the law. law. The law. law. Yeah, and Torah incidentally, means law. that. Yeah, and incidentally, that was the foundation of everything associated with the law of Moses. I mean, the rest of the Old Testament builds on the Pentateuch. Yeah, okay. All right, really wild question out there, completely unrelated. But what's the difference between the Torah and the Talmud? Talmud is the commentary. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. The Torah is the harder all the time, Brian. Yeah, and, and, and if you really want to get fun... Uh, what about the Ketuvim? Uh, the Mishnah. Oh, yeah, we could. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Or, the, or excuse me, the Tanakh. The, the, so Tanakh oh, is an acronym yeah, of an, Torah yeah. and the prophets, Law, Psalms, and Prophets. So yeah, Tanakh yeah. is just the Old Testament in Hebrew. Yeah, yeah, broken down into its three sections. So um, only one's inspired. The Talmud's not inspired. Well, the Tanakh is because the Tanakh yeah. is Genesis through Malachi. Yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's just a weird way of putting it, but it's uh, yeah. but it means the law. It's like Jesus uses this term in Luke. He says there's the law, the Psalms, the prophets, Luke and so the idea point is point. they're all. That's what all of it is. Even though we break it up and we say, well, there's history and there's prophets, they call yeah. history prophets. Yeah. So, but but between the Torah or what you said, the Tanuk and the Talmud, only one's inspired. The Talmud commentary by the men, well, the the the, the Torah the oral, and the Tanakh are inspired. Yeah. So two of them are inspired, but the Talmud or the okay. Mishnah sometimes it's called is not. So the Talmud is not. Uh, uh, that's, I got you. I got you. It's good people. Boy, we've made a mess of things today. But I was kind of grouping <laughs> well, well, the the I yeah, was grouping the Torah up. with the with the Tanakh because that's all the all the old. Yeah. 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 Um, um, John, the 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 word Tanakh it stands for uh, Torah, Nevi'im, and Ketuvim. And that is the three sections. Brian mentioned yeah. Luke 24, 44. Yeah. That's, the, that's where Jesus mentions the three sections. And, that's right. And, and it's our, it is our 39 books of the Old Testament. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, and, Jesus okay, said so. if, and Jesus said, if we want to enter, uh, it is necessary to knock. You know, to whoever knocks, it shall be open, etc. And we still have ten minutes to go, don't we? That's that's Tom or Bob at truthfactor dot com. Yeah, don't put that on Bob me. At truthfactor dot com. I'll be I'll okay. be written up. I will do. I want I want to apologize for even asking the question <laughs> because we've hit a went sideways real quick. But anyway, I thought it was interesting to note. And that I, you know, I didn't realize that's what it was called when, you know, the Torah or, and then the Tanakh, the whole group, I didn't realize that. So, but, um, so with that being said, going, that stemmed off the question of what's the Pentateuch. Let's then, verse number 15, the woman said to him, sir, give me this water that I may not thirst nor come here to draw. She didn't still comprehend, but that's her question. Go ahead, Bob. Uh, well, I didn't have anything in particular, but oh, uh, he, he does do this. He does do this. He proceeds to do this, but he first tells her to call her husband, knowing full well she has no yeah. husband. Yeah. And He's about to now show more about who he is. That's right. And so yeah. it's not until she brings a bunch of people with, him, with her from the city that he actually gives to them that living water. Good point. Good point. Okay, let's see. That John, was, yeah, Tom. Yeah. Can I make a quick observation before we move on to the next section? Sure. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I find I always use this passage from an evangelistic standpoint. How Jesus 
took a common circumstance that was going on and he turned it into a spiritual conversation. And, 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 and I think that's a, that's a great lesson for us. I mean, they were at a well, water. He turns it to living water, and he's going to use that to reveal who he is. That's a good point. You know, Jesus does that so, I mean, no surprise. He did that so well. He did it time and time again. And that's something we need to learn how to do. See opportunities yeah. to turn conversations about material things into conversations about spiritual things. Yeah, that's a good point. Good point. Um, at the risk of inflating Brian's ego a little bit farther, Gregor Impossible. puts in the comment, I now see what Chris meant. And he's talking about Chris's comment about Brian's brain. <laughs> <laughs> Bob's brain. Bob's it was brain. Not Bob's That's brain. It. it was Bob's not Bob's brain. brain. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Okay. Um, let's go ahead and share this comment real quick um, from VJ. VJ says, um, Jeremiah, from Jeremiah 2, verse 13, God is the fountain of living water. And then compare that with what we're looking at here in John chapter 4, verse 14. Whosoever drinketh of this water, um, that I shall give him shall never thirst. And we're kind of talking a little bit, what does this water mean? Um, it is the source of life. It's the word of God. It's, um, everything that goes, that would be summed up in the idea of abiding by the gospel of Christ. Yeah. Um, and then Brian shares John seven thirty eight there with that. Okay. Let me see. We are at almost the top of the hour. It's 1155. Uh, there's a good bit more we need to get into. Um, we would just read it and have a few comments before we'd need to pull our study to a close. So what do you guys think? Kind of next Thursday, pick up with verse 15. Yeah, we, we, we did 15, but we could bring that in oh. to set us for the rest of it. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, wouldn't hurt. That's right. The discussion could start at sixteen, but we'll start with fifteen just to kind of um, run and jump. There, a run and start. run and jump. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, okay. From uh, Brian, Tom, Bob, any final thoughts or comments? You now, know, train still hadn't come back to the station. Okay. <laughs> he hadn't remembered yeah. yet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I don't remember if I said early on when, when we identified VJ. Uh, mm -hmm. VJ's from India. I might have said the Philippines because you I, did say the Philippines. I meant, yeah, yeah, VJ, VJ is from, uh, from India and he's a gospel preacher over there. Okay. Uh, uh, along with, uh, um, uh, oh, the other one I'm looking for his name. Uh, Javon, yeah, Jibon. yeah, yeah. Both of them are from India, and 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 incidentally, that means they're at ten o'clock at night or somewhere in that neighborhood right now, ten or eleven o'clock at night. So, thank you for okay. joining us before you go to bed. Well, and thank I you thought to everybody else. I thought VJ looked a little bit different, and the name looked different for someone who would be from the Philippines, but I figured you knew more about it. So, <laughs> he's from India. Okay. Yeah. Always a mistake to assume Tom knows more. That's my, my. He he's not a bomb. Yeah. I yeah. Mean, what that's can what, say? That's why they didn't say Brain Thomas. <laughs> All uh, right. I have one last comment to say that yeah. uh, mm -hmm. one of the questions kind of reminds us about the significance of the living water conversation. Um, it's kind of neat that John is going to use the the bread of life and living water both as ideas of the message that that Jesus is bringing and and it's important for us to understand that that's what you know Jesus is the bread of life but then we say Jesus's words are actually the bread of life um more specifically so um that's why when we sometimes we sing a song that says break now the bread of life we're talking about the word of god we're talking about the message of god living water um same idea the idea of the message from god that brings us life that, that brings us to life. And when Jesus works miracles about bread, you know, the, the feeding of the thousands of people, it, it really, uh, in fact, John chapter six is going to tell us that that's really about um, giving us the word of God, giving us the, the gospel message, 
that can bring us to life and let us be people that then can deliver that life to others. We can share that message with others and give them life too. So it's really um, it's really important uh, because later on, we've already mentioned John chapter 7, Jesus is going to come back and say, I'm giving you the living water. Um, the prophets talked about this. You know, Isaiah said that one day there would come food that you couldn't buy and and drink. And, you know, the idea that this was this was God's promise um, it has to sit in the back of a lot of people's minds looking for um, the message. So so Jesus's words aren't just, you know, it's a nice allegory. It's a prophetic one. That's a good point. Good point. Good explanation. And on that, we'll pull our study to a close. We'd like to thank you so much for joining us for our study today. If you have a question or comment for us, you can uh, please feel free to email it to us. You can send it to questions at truthfactorlive.com. And if it's something that we can answer in next week's study, we will do our best to do that. Or if you just want to compliment Bob because of his brain, you can write him Bob at truthfactor.com or any of us Tom at truthfactor.com or Bob. You got to remember when, when we have this little quad right now, this little quad section set up, you point at somebody. I think you're pointing at Tom, but you could be pointing at Brian. I don't know who you're pointing to. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. On my screen, uh, Brian brain is to my bottom left. Oh, <laughs> uh, he's over there. Well, the people at home think you're talking Stand about here. Tom. You're over there, John. <laughs> All right. All right. Listen, thank you so much. And hopefully you can join us again next Thursday at 11 o'clock a.m. Central Time um, as we continue our study through the Gospel of John. We'll pick up with Chapter 4, verse 15 next week. Thank you so much for joining us, and we'll see you, see you next week. Have a great week now. Bye-bye.